I'm Todd Satterston, and this is the Better Books Podcast. This is episode three, and in this episode, I interview Michael Schrag, who is a research fellow at MIT and the author of several books. Uh, in this episode, we talk about two of them, um, the first being, Who Would You Want Your Customers to Become?, and The Innovator's Hypothesis. In the first part of the episode, we talk about what it means to design customers and why it's so important in the realm of business to create experiments and why they're actually better than having good ideas. And in the second half of the interview, we take these same concepts and look at how they might apply to um, the work of being an author, a publisher, and what it means for the future of book publishing. Enjoy. So let's start with that first book. Let's start with, you know, so it's 2012 and you write this, it's an ebook. I mean, I don't know if it ever came out in as print. It seemed like it was a slightly smaller. Sadly, no. <laughs> right. No, sadly, no. It was a smaller project. It was called, um, Who Do You Want Your Customer to Become? And here's the first thought that I had when I was, I was reading it. I thought, oh, okay, yeah. You know, if we go to Peter Drucker's famous, very, very famous quote of, you know, the only purpose of a business is to create a customer. And I thought to myself, oh, OK, so transaction, sale, continued support, you know, delight your customers, serve your customers. But, you know, even with all of that language, you go one step further and you say that you should design your customers and that kind of broke my brain. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about like the main premise of the book and what you mean by like, does, what does it mean to design bless, your customers or think in that way? Bless you, <laughs> bless you. I didn't mean to break your brain, but that's the exact kind of thing. And, and, and the thing is, it's, it's, you know, I'm a huge admirer of Peter Drucker. And, you know, my, my dad actually showed, you know, films on a 16 millimeter projector of, you know, uh, uh, Drucker doing his effective executive shtick with his thick Viennese accent. But the purpose of a business is to create a customer. And, and, and it's quotable, and he says, the two most important functions in a business are marketing and innovation. Right. But the problem with Drucker's work, and I've, I've read it, is what do you do after you create the customer? You delight it. It's, but, but if the customer is an asset, if the customer is what is really the, the source of value, you're wrong to look at it as how do we have an effective or efficient transaction or exchange with the customer. No, we should look at customers as people, as entities we invest in, in the same way. And this is, you know, I'm a, from the University of Chicago background. You have Ted Schultz and Gary Becker talking about the importance of human capital, human capital in your, your, in, in your workplace, in the enterprise. You know, organizations that have superior, quote unquote, human capital will win in the marketplace. Well, what about your customers? human capital? What about the client's human capital? How do we improve the return on human capital of customers and clients? Well, you have to invest in them. Well, what kind of invest? Well, you're not just going to give them money. So how do you invest in your customer? And the, and the, the breakthrough was the notion of, well, what do innovations do? Innovations create new customer capabilities that if you have the right business model, you figure out how to monetize. Google does that well. Facebook does that well. Amazon does that well. If you, McKinsey does that well. PricewaterhouseCoopers, certain professional services do that well. How do you invest in your customers? Who do you want your customers to become? Not just in the moment, but over time. You look at a guy like Sam Walton, and what did he do? He created customers, everyday low price shoppers, customers who expected to get the, the best price for the best brands. You look at Henry Ford. What do, what do people associate with Henry, Henry Ford? Mass production. How could that be wrong? It's not wrong. It doesn't go far enough. The real innovation of Henry Ford was not the mass production line. It was the driver, the human capital of driving. Why is that a hard concept for people to grasp? I think it's an easy and obvious one to grasp the more you think about it and the more you look at the impact 
of innovative organizations on their markets. It seems like we, we want to leave it at the abstraction. It seems like we want to leave it at, oh, this company did this to this market. And, exactly. Right? And, and, it, and it feels like, you know, what's so, what, what again, what, what I had to think so hard about is you kept pushing to that next point of who, but who are those individuals and what's really going on with them and what can we do um, to make them better? The Another line from the book you use is that um, all those companies that you just you you walked through Walmart and McKinsey and and uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper Amazon, Amazon right? Sure. right? Uh, you 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 have this line in the book where you say um, they've made they've all made their customers more valuable. And I thought right. that's a great so riff on that for a second when when you so. so yeah. So the line, the, the, the design heuristic I encourage in my exec ed classes and in my clients is making customers better makes better customers. Making clients better makes better clients. If you're just making your customers better, but you're not monetizing or getting value from it in any way, then you're doing charity and philanthropy. But if you're just making them better customers or better clients without making them better, you're a ruthless predatory exploiter. So the heuristic is how do you create a virtuous cycle between making customers better and making better customers? And what's the magic ingredient, the secret sauce of the 21st century that improves the odds that you can facilitate and create those kinds of virtuous cycles? It's data. It's data. We can instrument customers. We can gain insight into customers. We can gather data on customers to learn how to customize and segment and personalize experiences and interactions and engagements and features and functionality so that we make it easier and simpler and, if you'll excuse the, the phrase, better for the customer to get better. That's a win. That's a huge win. Mm-hmm. The l- let me uh, let me go another direction for a second. Or, or you sure. know, when I think about um, the when I think about how it is that I want to try to work with customers, um, the question that I might ask is I might say something like, "What is the biggest problem that you're dealing with?" Right. And when I think about your work. The, what it wants me to do, it wants me to change the question and say, um, what could I do to make you more successful? What could I do to make you better? And so is there any problem with either one of those questions? Is one question uh, better no, you're, than the you're, other? You're, 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 no, this is a, you've really hit on, and I don't mean to sound like a sucker, <laughs> you've hit upon one of the great schizophrenia and tender areas, pun intended, that I've, that I've run across, you know, when, when uh, uh, presenting this approach to value creation and collaboration, which is there are a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm saying, but they're, they're, they're dealing with a pain point. Mm. You know, their customers, make the, make the pain go away, make the pain stop, make my problem go away. And you're, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that, technically. But at, at some point, it's like, if you're a doctor, are you really, is, 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 is the right dose of anesthesia really the way to affect the patient future, not just the moment in time? So I believe that the, the, the people who do the best job of building upon the kind of issues that I've described use that pain use that problem as a portal, as a gateway, as an entry to the broader question, Mm. which is precisely because I or we've solved your problem or reduced your pain, we have credibility. So we can do better for, we're not just going to solve your problem, we're going to put you collaboratively with your consent, with your participation, with your collaboration on a path to getting better in your eyes in your mind, in your heart. We want to do the things that improve 
the quality of your life, your competence, your capabilities, your creativity, whatever. So to me, the real challenge where, where this is as much craft or even more craft and art than science is mm-hmm. how do you create a seamless linkage between the problem-solving value prop and the transform to make you better value mm-hmm. prop? Let's picture those as intersecting circles. Mm-hmm. Do they just touch in a tangential way or do they overlap significantly? you know, with the crosshatch and the shading. I don't know, but geez, what a fun problem to work on with organizations. The the next place that your work sort of led me to was I was thinking about, um, you, you know, your colleague at MIT, Eric Von Hippel. And Great guy. so much of his work is around um, user-based innovation, right? So his beliefs are that gosh, 60, 70, 80% of innovation that you end up seeing back in the marketplace originates, right? It originates actually with the customers that, you know, uh, users generate the ideas. Actually, not customers, lead users. Lead users. Um, So again, if if we're going to take this approach that we have been uh, so far, how does... Eric's work sort of tie in with this. How does, um, you know, it's enormously. It, yeah, right? Enormously. Eric's work had a big impact on mine. Uh, we approach things from a different angle. This goes back to my epistemological origins, where the focus of my work was not on um, investing in customers, but looking at how individuals and organizations used prototypes and models and simulations to manage innovation and risk. And I'm saying innovation and risk, not innovation or risk. My argument, my insight was that prototypes aren't just used as a vehicle to get a sense of what the limitations and constraints are, but to explore the potential and to craft an indifference curve and understand the trade-offs between the benefits we can get from these kinds of features and functionality versus the risks that they entail. And I became interested in the medium of the prototypes. Are they clay models? Are they digital models, et cetera? But what, the, and so, so if you'll forgive me for doing this mashup, what does a prototype ask a lead user or a user to become? Well, somebody who will play with it, somebody who will explore with it, somebody who wants to learn from it, somebody who wants to improve it. That said, you learn a lot from somebody who looks at the prototype and touches the prototype and says, I have no interest in this. You know, that's a that's very revealing, you know, economic terms reveal preference as well. But the lead users are the ones who say, this is great, you know, or this is interesting, but you know what would make it better? X would make it better. And geez, you'd never have gotten that in a focus group. You could only get that from the explicit interaction of playing with, exploring that prototype. I was at the media lab, the MIT media lab, you know, a little bit after I'd become familiar familiar with Eric's work, but I was working with the the folks at the media lab. I was doing a fellowship there. And, you know, the the cliche surrounding the media lab and the Nick Negroponte early days of it was demo or die. You know, in traditional academia, it's publish or perish. At the Media Lab, it was demo or die. And people would build demos to show as proof of concepts of their work, of their research and its potential and its implications. But I noticed something. I noticed something really important when people were demoing their research and their prototypes. There were people who would do show and tell demos, which is, you know, here's what I'm doing. What do you think? And there were people who would do show and ask demos. Here's what I'm doing. How can we make it better? Does this really reflect a fair representation of the problem, the opportunity, the potential of the technology? And I became much more interested in the show and ask folks than the show and tell folks. Because the show and tell folks were trying to use the prototypes to make a point. The show and ask folks were people trying to use the prototype to build a user experience and and those were sort of my epistemological cognitive experiential origins of the notion of 
prototypes aren't just for proof of concept. They're ways of influencing and transforming the expectations and the perceptions of their users. Mm -hmm. And it's consistent with Eric's stuff Mm -hmm. because the lead users are not the people who play with the prototypes. They're the people who add value and transform the prototypes. That's what makes them leads. Mm -hmm. So my work really was uh, uh, built upon and is uh, is orthogonal to and builds upon Eric's work and lead users around the medium of the prototype. But what does it have in common? Human capital. How do innovations in technology transform and add value to human capital? And and I think what it, as as often happens, is I think people want to go, well, at first you said I was supposed to be leading my customers in a direction. I was supposed to be designing them. I was supposed to be making them more valuable. Uh, and now you're telling me I'm going to be listening to them. I'm going to be, you know, I might show something to them, ask them what they think. They might go, eh, I don't like that. But if you did this. No, 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 no. And, you, you, I, I, and forgive it, me. Go no, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I think that's, that's not quite fair. Yeah. Ultimately, you want to design. You, you, you do. You do. But, but I want to make it clear. I, I don't think people are, are, are lab rats or guinea pigs. I don't think customers and human beings or organizations are clay that, you know, malleable clay and metal that you forge or shape or mold to do what you want. I, I think it, it, there's something different going on. Designing a customer is, is you know, what do they want? Who do they, you know, when I say, who do you want your customers to become? At some point, you got to ask, who do they want to become? Who do they want to become? This is the Smithian notion of fair exchange. You know, I, I don't want you us to impose a, a, an authoritarian or totalitarian vision of the customer. I want us to design a customer. Who, who do you want to become? Who do you want to become? And what is the negotiation space? The products, the services, the experience that your organization, your enterprise provides. So clearly who Amazon wants its customers to become is going to be different than who Walmart wants its customers to become. It's going to be different than who Toys R Us wants its customers to become. Whoops. (laughs) Toys R Us is bankrupt. Yeah. I wanted you, you stopped me short, but I I completely agree that um, I wanted to point at the collaboration. I wanted to point at the, the interaction between both parties um, that's going on there. And exactly. I, I 100% uh, agree but you, with you. you, but, you but you introduced me and you left out my <laughs> first book. My first book was called Shared Minds. It was a book about collaboration and shared space. Yeah. Shared space is about what? Shared space is facilitating collaboration is about what? Facilitating human capital. Mm-hmm. Getting more complementary, supplementary human capital. Watson collaborates with Crick. They couldn't have done it on their own. Their combined human capital led to the breakthrough discovery of DNA, the double helix. So, Watson and Crick, Impressionism. Um, uh, not imp- excuse me, Watson and Crick, not Impressionism, uh, Acutism. Uh, um, Rob Renova write the, the, the airplane. So... Let's talk about the book, the next book. The next book sure. was Innovators Hypothesis. Hypothesis. And I want to change the subtitle and turn it into a question. Um, sure. Because the what you pose is the premise of the book is tell me why cheap experiments are worth more than good ideas. Because it ties, ex- mm-hmm. it's a direct tie to what it is we were just talking about. So now we're talking about method almost. Like what's our method to get to um, finding these good collaboration points, finding the best method of helping customers. So why are cheap experiments better than these good, often crazy ideas that we have about what people might want? I, you know, the if one were to look at the the two-star reviews of my book on Amazon, you'll find that what they have in common is not the, what I believe, the illiteracy of the readers, but the, the, the anger, the, the visceral, hostile anger and reaction to a chapter where I 
uh, uh, vehemently and ruthlessly critique the value of quote unquote good ideas. I think good ideas are grotesquely overrated. I think good ideas are the wrong unit of analysis to discuss innovation and creativity. I believe that good ideas, frankly, are on average bad. What do most people say when they've spent a lot of time with a good idea? Well, it seemed like a good, when they pursue a good idea, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. For me, discussing innovation in the context of good ideas is like debating paintings or sculptures, the quality of painting or sculptures based on how much they weigh. Yes, there's a factual empirical basis to how much it weighs, a sculpture weighs or a painting weighs, but it doesn't have a lot to do with the aesthetic experience. In the same way, when one really looks at innovation in the real world, in situ, it's not about the quality of the idea. It's about how that idea is instantiated in a representation. Gee, a prototype or as I refer to in my first book, a shared space. But more explicitly, what I really believe in the, the transformative uh, concept that I urge organizations to consider is how do we get people to stop thinking in terms of good ideas and think in terms of testable hypotheses instead? A testable hypothesis is more valuable than a good idea. In fact, to my mind, a good idea isn't a good idea until it gets transformed into a testable hypothesis. Because once you frame something as a testable hypothesis, then you can do those real world or in silico experiments that give you real insight. So I think ideas suck as a way to think about creativity and innovation. We, serious individuals, serious organizations, and then I'm, I'm going to toss in, you know, the Newtons and the Einsteins and the, and the uh, um, Pasteurs, and you pick a, pick a Nobel on, on this, that what really mattered was not just the quality of the idea. It was the way it was put into a testable hypothesis that inspired innovation and test. Even in theory, what do you have? That it, it, It's not the quality of the theory that gets you the Nobel. It's the way that is theor that theory gets to be tested in the universe, in the cosmos, in a test tube, in a centrifuge, in some sort of instrument. That's what I'm interested in. Let's focus on the testable hypothesis. So the thing I thought of when um, you 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 took umbrage with um, uh, good ideas was mm -hmm. that the problem it feels like with good ideas is that, see if you agree with me, um, we were probably testing them. We were probably doing some stuff with them to see whether or not they would work. Maybe not effectively, maybe not mm -hmm. efficiently, um, mm -hmm. but we were doing stuff and then at what, you know, at some point, there were ideas that didn't work, and we sort of let those off to the side. And yeah, you there, mean we were throwing it against the wall to see if it stuck? Sure. Yeah, right. we were doing that. Um, but I think you're asking, as you know, in the case you just made, you're asking for something that's much more rigorous. Rigorous. Um, much. You mean I'm asking for rigor and thinking through, and exploring limitations and parameters. Shame on me. <laughs> yes, shame on you. The uh, so, okay. So tell me, what does a good experiment look like? What maybe? Let me start. Actually, what does a good hypothesis look like? And what does a good experiment look like in? I think in this business sense that we're talking about, because I think um, sometimes us trying to translate what like, you gave great examples, the Nobels and the science and that sometimes that translation is hard for us or we want to sort of put it off to the side and we're like, well, we're business. Like we're much more practical than those, you know, the science people. Oh so, my God. So oh talk, my God. To, right? What I mean, is I, more I, practical than an, I, 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 why, why is the brand 
of a good idea seem to be more practical than a real world experiment. I mean, it makes it literally makes no sense to me. I agree. You know, it's why people like Kahneman win the Nobel Prize. We talk about cognitive biases and heuristic <laughs> shortcuts. Right. You know, don't cheat. Right. Don't cheat. Do the bloody experiment. So what what does a what what's a good testable what what, what what's a hypothesis? I'll tell you what's a good testable hypothesis. You don't know the answer in advance. It has two qualities. You don't know the answer in advance, so you're not validating the hypothesis. You're testing it. You don't know, and you care. You want to know. Your curiosity is not just intellectual. It's tinged with an emotion of caring. Okay? Yeah. That's it. You don't know, and you really want to know, and there's a significant reason why you want to know in business you know uh, my, my my line is in science experimentation is a search for truth in business experimentation is a search for value now are value and the truth inimical of course not are they rivals of course not but they're not the same thing a testable hypothesis around value is a different organizing principle than a testable hypothesis around the search for the truth. And that's why there are so many scientists and engineers who can't make the leap to commercial success because their hypothesis mindset focuses on the truth rather than are we creating value. Hmm. Now, what's a good experiment? Yeah. A good experiment is the opposite of magic. A good experiment, everybody understands what's going on, and you look at it and you say, I'm convinced, or wow, wow, we should do something on this. We should build on this. The great experiments, there's persuasion. And they went to the top of, you know, dropped the, the balls of different weights, the, you know, I know that's an apocryphal story, but you can do the same thing with, with Newton. You can do it with all of these, you know, read Ram Hare's book on, you know, 20 great science experiments. There's a quality of rhetoric, not just logos and logic, but rhetoric, persuasion. Great experiments, and my gosh, great business experiments persuade. It ain't no accident that Google, Amazon, and Facebook are literally doing thousands of experiments on and with their users, even as we speak. And, and they're doing everything, and Microsoft, they're doing A-B experimentation, they're doing multivariates. Mm -hmm. Digital platforms dramatically reduce the cost of experimentation. Back to my Media Lab origins, the Media Lab was about bits, not atoms. I can say without hesitation, experimentation with bits tends to be orders of magnitude cheaper than experimentation with atoms. Mm -hmm. And that's why the most valuable companies in the world are based on bits. Because the because your argument is that the testing is so much more so much cheaper and so much more efficient cheaper, that they can create efficient and scalable. They can learn more, experiment and scale exactly. Mm -hmm. Faster. The economics, the yeah. exponential economics of innovation if you're running a digital platform, are awesome. They're awesome. And these companies have the market caps to prove it. Hell, they have, Facebook has over a billion, a billion users. Mm -hmm. Good luck, I mean, not, I don't want to minimize uh, uh, Exxon Mobil, you know, I, I don't want to minimize, but, but you, you know the surest way to boost return on assets and innovation for, for an Exxon Mobil, it's, it's improving the data components. Mm -hmm. It's improving the information layer. It's doing things like machine learning. It's using digital capabilities as a force multiplier for those atoms. I got nothing against atoms. Some of my best friends are made up of atoms. <laughs> but in terms of value creation, the surest way to add value to atoms is to make sure they're they're approached by the right bits. So let's try to take what we've talked about and put a lens of um, being an author or being a publisher mm -hmm. and thinking through 
Um, uh, you know, my belief is every book is a startup. I mean, I think writing books is a act of Brilliant. innovation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's an act of innovation. And if we take, you know, the first book we talked about this morning, this idea that we want to, you know, usually I think when authors think about the books they're writing, they're hoping to inform people. They're hoping that they, you know, maybe they'll change them a little. Um, mm -hmm. But if I was an author and I wanted to think about your premise of um, how can I make a book that helps customers become who they should be, what does that look like? How would I think about it? What what might I bring differently to that process than um, what I might traditionally think of? Well, this is this is the question that you've asked is a very very painful question <laughs> because first off, you've begged the question that a book represents the appropriate way of packaging things mm -hmm. or presenting things or being the platform. I mean, you know. You, you talk about why people's motivations for writing a book. I can tell you that, that the people I know who've written books, sometimes it's because they had a story they had to tell mm -hmm. or because they want to put down or codify their own expertise. And, you know, one of the lines that I've used is that in my own academic life, in my own professional life, I believe that, that I've been on a trajectory going away from how do I do a better job of transmitting my expertise to cultivating capability. That's how I approach my classes. That's how I approach my clients. It's not how do I do a better job of communicating my expertise. It's how do I do a better job of cultivating the relevant capabilities in my, in my students and in my, and in my uh, clients. Okay. Yeah. The other is I, I want to, for completely understandable reasons, you know, the book, there, there's text, you know, that the book is a, a, a bundle of things. I, I'm, is, is the issue writing a book or is the issue improving the reading experience? Should the focus be on the medium or the experience? Are we better off, forgive the cliche, multimodal? Where would I be better off not doing a book and doing a podcast or doing a, forgive me, YouTube video versus versus 50 or 60 pages. I think this is one of the real challenges that that quote unquote traditional authors are, are re refused to confront, refuse to confront, you know, it, to, to make a vulgar comparison. It's like if I ask a brilliant poet and said, you know, you have to write limericks from now on, you know, that that that's maybe they'll make a good living, but but is that what they really is that what they really want to do? So we have to have the courage to ask ourselves: Do we really care more about our reader and the experience we wish to share, or do we really care more about quote unquote the book? And if you're a publisher, if you're a Knopf, if you're a Harper Collins, you know. You have very, very, or traditional university press, like my press, MIT Press, or Harvard University Press. You know, you, you are living, you are sleeping in the Procrustean bed of publishing physical dead tree books. And you look at the digital stuff as ancillary or undermining, or to use a popular word, disruptive. So the question, the seemingly innocent question that you're asking me is the equivalent to my mind and heart of the snake saying to Eve, go ahead, take a bite. It's the apple of knowledge, you know. It doesn't end well. You get kicked out. Uh, I'm still I, I, I'm still convinced books matter. Um, I, excuse, oh, excuse me. Where did I say books you did not? Matter? You did not. You said we should checking. look at. We should look at <laughs> the right way. What is the best way for that idea to be conveyed? And I'm 100 percent um, convinced of that. And I think the things, some of the things that you're pointing out, are incredibly important. That sometimes the motivations or the biases that an author and or publisher may have that's leading towards the creation of the book may not be in the best interest of the reader or the customer, um, that things Bingo. may be lost. Bingo. And in an environment where those customers and readers have more choices, 
rather than fewer choices, less time rather than more time, those biases that used to be annoyances may become insurmountable obstacles. That's my concern. So then I think it takes us to really to the second premise that we spent time talking about, which is the question of experiments. What would good experiments look like, um, given this wonderful introduction to it or the, 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 the greater uncertainty that you're bringing to that question? Um, what, what would good experiments look like for an author? Um, I was going to ask before. Well, we see things, we, we see yeah. things like neat and, you know, works in process. I mean, I would love to have, you know, we, we see, um, oh God, what's his name? The guy who did Pyra, Evan, Evan Williams, you know, doing Medium. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do think they're, they're interesting digital experiments, wikis, community oriented. There, there, there are a variety of different ways that I see a lot. I see, here's what I see. Experimentation without experiments, you know, there's not the kind of discipline in it that I would like. There's not the sort of A-B format that I would like, but I, I genuinely see intriguing things going on. I find myself spending more time on the medium site or looking at Manning Presses and O'Reilly Presses, Meeps and Books and, 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 and Process. I do find myself pivoting between listening to an author or presenter and reading his or her work. Mm -hmm. So I do find myself, you know, forgive this hideous mashup of, of, of cliches, I do find myself massaged by different touch points in the, in the reading experience. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, that's nonfiction. You know, that's, that's experiential around uh, cultivation of my knowledge and capabilities. Yes. You know, for, for um, novels and things, it's, 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 really, it's really quite interesting. I, I don't have the patience to commit to an alternative world, you know, I read all, you know, I read the, 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 the foundation trilogy, the, the Hobbit. I mean, I read, I read all of this. I didn't do the game of Thrones stuff, you know, the George R. 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 Martin stuff, yep. but I, I read science fiction up, as you might imagine, up the wazoo, but I don't feel as a middle-aged adult, the willingness to make that kind of commitment to three or four volumes of, of, I, I don't, I don't want to commit to a trilogy. The text book. You know, my mind's eye is fantastic, but but you know, I would rather be challenged in other ways. So so I'm at a stage where the the that in for fictional worlds, I I want novelty and innovation. I want stuff that I don't read. You know, I'm, I I'll, I'll I'll look at short stories or shorter stories or a book, but but I'm not going to commit to a to a to an alternative uh, to Larry Niven's Ringworld. I'm not not going to do it. Right. So that's me. What if I look at I look at I look at comics again. I yeah. look at I look at manga yeah. again. Yeah. You know, I'm I am open. You know, it's, uh, forgive my taking a, treating this as therapy, but I am open <laughs> to different kinds of experiences. But but I'm not that interested in recapturing the commitments I made as a twelve year old. The if I go back to your what you were talking about with. On the nonfiction side, the you know, right? Um, information is knowledge, um, and to connect it completely through to your how can I improve the capabilities of the people that I'm working with? Um, and you you said it's interesting to see the experimentation, but maybe not actual experiments that you know, they're not the gravitas that we were talking about earlier around, you know, hypothesis driven science. If right. If I was a if I was a publisher, what if we tried to bring that lens to publishing or book publishing? If we're going to pretend to be one, let's pretend to be a consultant to a book publisher right now. What sort of hypothesis driven? Um, if we were to riff on it for a second, what sort of hypothesis driven science could we bring to that to make sure that we don't become irrelevant that we don't um become the things that you know people use as furniture but ta, don't really ta, read anymore ta, ta, ta. i'm now going to do the thing that makes you want to reach through the phone and grab me by the windpipe <laughs> and pull i'm gonna listen to that publisher or that family or that group 
voices. I know that they're literate. I know that they're well-read. I know that they have powers of focus and concentration. I know that they probably care a lot about what it is they publish and what it is they stand for. And I'm going to ask them, who do you want your readers or customers to become? Who are your best customers or your typical ones? Do you have examples where you've turned your typical customers, your typical readers into your best readers? Do you have examples where your best readers have become your best advocates? You know, it's, it's a, it's a two-sided market. Mm-hmm. Who are your best authors? You know, what, what have they done? Who do they want their readers? To, are, are they more interested in telling their stories or do they really want to build a, do they want fans? Do they want zealots? Do they want advocates? Do they want to have their own con around them? Do they want to have their own cult around them? And if those people aren't capable or aren't willing to have a serious conversation that we can turn into design and d- design philosophies and testable hypotheses, I don't think I'm going to be able to help them very much. You know? Maybe they don't want to work with authors who want their own cults. Maybe they do. Maybe, maybe the issue is we want to create the best possible books and the unit of analysis, the book or the unit of the analysis. Do you want the books to be read or reread or both? I I don't know Mm -hmm. Exante, but I will say this. I am, as I'm sure you can tell, I am enough of a reader to hell with being a writer. I am enough of a reader. I have a perfectly good insight. I've worked with publishers. on. I know what kind of questions they ask, or more importantly, what kind of questions they don't ask. You know, they don't even know, they don't even have a deal with Amazon that will tell them how many books they've sold through Amazon or the prices. Amazon is a, a, a opaque to them because that's one of the ways that Amazon has abused the system, but that's a conversation for another time. Mm-hmm. You know, there are information asymmetries there that Amazon exploits to its benefit and to the benefits of its customers, but not, of course, to the benefit of many, if not most, of its suppliers. Okay, but I want to, those are the kinds of questions I would begin with. I'm not interested in doing an experiment for the sake of doing an experiment. I'm interested in doing an experiment to give me insight in who I want to test the hypotheses associated with who I want my customers, be they an author or a reader, to become. Mm 